Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to try to estimate the postmortem interval, which if you remember from our previous videos is the amount of time since an individual was killed or since an individual was murdered. Um, a lot of times the body isn't discovered uh, for several hours or several days. And so we can utilize insect activity and insect evidence with the help of forensic entomologists to try to put together a timeline and establish this post-mortem interval utilizing a variety of information pieces which we'll get to in a minute okay so when estimating the post-mortem interval using insect activity we have to look for insect activity right so insects and insects uh, larva specifically the larva which is the pre pupa or the pre-adult stage the feeding the actively feeding stage of insect development are often found near a body or on a body and those are the individual uh, organisms that can help us and help scientists estimate how long the body's been there or how long the individual has been deceased um, different species of insects will arrive in or on the body or in the area at different times. Some flies are going to um, be attracted to the body within minutes. Several other insects are going to come in several days later. Some insects are going to come in and feed on larvae, so they won't get there until the larvae actually establish themselves. Um, Different times of the month, different times of the year, different environmental conditions can impact the way insects colonize a body uh, or colonize an area. And the insects have to be in an area before colonizing the body. Um, there are a lot of different variables and, and descriptors that have to be met in an insect development in order for them to successfully colonize a body or colonize an area. So at crime scenes, live insects that are colonizing the body are collected some are immediately preserved in jars like this. Some of them will be kept alive. And those that are most abundant, right, or the oldest, it is important for us to collect the oldest larva. We don't want to collect the youngest. We want to collect the oldest. Because the oldest larva were deposited on the body first, which means it gives us a more accurate estimation of the postmortem intervals if we can actually collect and identify the age of the oldest larva on the body because the youngest larva would have been deposited on the body several days uh, more recently than the oldest larva were deposited and we want to find out the oldest because we want to figure out how long the body's been there okay um, I just talked about the live specimens. We're going to immediately preserve some of them, but we're also going to keep some of them alive. And we're going to send those live specimens, the live larvae, to a lab, specifically to forensic entomology labs, uh, because we want to raise them to adulthood because it's easier for forensic entomologists to accurately um, identify the species of the adult flies over the larva. Um, as you can imagine, all of the larvae of a lot of different fly species all look very, very similar, if not identical. But when they actually um, grow and rear the fly larva to adulthood, you can actually see a lot of differences um, among the different fly species. And these are just three fly species. This one is a bottle fly, um, sometimes called a blow fly. This one's a green bottle fly or green blow fly. This one, this one is a flesh fly, and then this one is your house fly. You can see that they have different phenotypic expressions or different expressions of traits. Some of them are green like this one, some have stripes, some are more muted. Um, but all of these can be more easily identified looking at adult species uh, or adult specimens versus larva specimens. So, focus in on the bottle fly. Um, or the blowfly. Since blowflies usually arrive on a body or colonize a body within minutes of death, they are the essential timekeepers for the estimation of this postmortem interval. Um, they are the first inhabitants of a body because they can identify those death gases or the gases that are going to be um, given off by a, a very recently deceased individual. Um, we know that insects follow a very predictable pattern of succession. We've talked about this pattern of succession um, in this complete metamorphosis 
life cycle in previous videos, so you should know how that happens. Um, these flies lay eggs. Those eggs develop into first instar larvae. Those first instars develop into second instars, which develop into third instars, which pupate, which then turn into adults, all within a very predictable pattern of succession. We call that complete metamorphosis, and we call it a life cycle. Since we know the life cycle, um, it is possible then to predict the postmortem interval, which is the amount of time an individual has been deceased, by working backwards, since we know how long each species takes to complete each stage of development. So how do we figure out how long each species takes? Well, that identifies, or that takes a lab, okay? These flies have been very controlled, um, reared, okay? Reared or developed in a very controlled manner, meaning we control the temperature, we control all the factors. The only thing that we are measuring is the amount of time it takes for these flies to completely metamorph, okay, or go through their complete metamorphosis from egg to adulthood in a controlled setting at different temps. And since we know at different temps in a controlled setting how long each stage takes, we can take that information and we can use it to estimate the amount of time it would have taken or should have taken those flies to colonize a body in an uncontrolled situation, which obviously is a crime scene. We don't control crime scenes because they happen kind of organically um, in, in a lot of different environmental conditions. And so a couple different examples. If blowflies uh, or blowfly eggs are found on the body without the presence of larva, the estimated postmortem interval is usually less than 24 hours because we know that it takes roughly 24 hours for eggs once laid to hatch into first instar larva. Okay, so if we just find eggs and no instars, we know that we have to be within that first 24 hours. Um, if blowfly larvae are present on the body and most of them have developed into the third instar larva stage, we can make calculations to determine how long it must have taken or should have taken the third instar stage to have developed in the environment or the environmental conditions that we obviously can measure at the crime scene. Finding empty pupil cases at a crime scene is really an important observation or discovery because it means the postmortem interval is long enough for the insects to develop to adulthood. That means if we find these empty pupil shells, it means the complete life cycle has taken uh, or taken place, which means that not only have flies colonized the body and have laid eggs um, or deposited eggs, and those eggs... Um, completely morphed between first, second, third, instar, before pupating, before hatching out of their empty pupil cases, which is leaving the empty pupil cases there. The only way that the empty shells or the empty cases should have or could have been left behind is if flies would have completely um, kind of went through their entire life cycle on the body in that particular location, okay? So, um, a little bit more about how to estimate this postmortem interval. Forensic entomologists must account for many different variables or environmental conditions that affect insect development greatly. Two of those variables would be local temperatures, which means the temperatures in the scene of the crime or at the scene that the body was found, and then environmental conditions. What are those environmental conditions? Those are things like is it wet? Has it rained? Has it precipitated? Has it frozen? Okay, or has it frosted? Um, is it dry? Is it humid? Is it hot? Is it cold? Those are all important variables that have to be considered when we are determining or estimating this postmortem interval. A couple terms you need to know. Ava position is egg laying. Um, this ava position, position will not occur at night. Flies do not lay eggs in the night. Um, they do not lay eggs in the rain, and they do not lay eggs if temperatures or other environmental conditions are not suitable. The flies know whether or not the environment is conducive to larva development. Flies aren't stupid. They don't want to lay their eggs in an environment, even if there's ample food supply, okay, even if there's a freshly deceased individual, if the conditions are not suitable for rearing their young, meaning the larva will likely die, the flies are not going to lay their eggs. So, if a body was deposited in a particular environment at night, it is likely 
that the flies will find the body, but they will not actually lay their eggs on the body until the sun comes up, which can obviously throw a wrench into our estimation of the postmortem interval because if the body was, was placed um, early in the evening, there could be six, seven, eight hours sometimes, depending on the time of year, um, before the eggs would have been placed, meaning the body would have been six to eight hours older than we put, uh, we estimated uh, based on looking at the eggs or the larva stage. Um, another variable that we have to kind of account for is feeding maggot masses, which is um, the, the group of maggots, which can be seen on a dead body, um, has an internal temperature that is 5 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the ambient temperature. So if the ambient temp temperature outside is 90 degrees, it could actually be as much as 95 to 110 degrees warmer inside in the center or in the the kind of center of that mass which means as temperatures go up maggots will develop and mature at a faster rate so you have to know that we need to take temperatures of the maggot mass in order to most accurately predict the postmortem interval or pmi because the maggots aren't exposed necessarily to the ambient air temp they're exposed to the internal maggot mass temp, which is where they're actually living. So forensic entomologists must ask several questions or the following questions when assessing insect development. These are all questions which will greatly impact the ways insects are developing or maturing and the speed at which insects are developing. So the first question was the body clothed. If the body was clothed, then it obviously is harder for insects to colonize the body or get to the body, which can impact insect development. Was the body wrapped, frozen, or inaccessible to insects, th thus delaying insect colonization again? If insects cannot get to the body, or if the body is frozen, they're not going to colonize the body because they physically can't eat it. Okay. Was the body buried? If the body was buried, how deep was it buried? Okay. There are certain insects that live in the soil. There are certain insects that can dig into the soil. If the body is buried very deeply, um, insects just can't get to it. Okay, and So that's going to obviously impact the insect development or insect development at all. Was the burial medium penetrable to insects? Again, can insects physically get through the medium, which is the, the substance that the body was buried in? Okay, Could the medium release decomposition gases? Again, if the body cannot, or if the medium cannot release the decomp gases, then the gases will not attract the flies and therefore will not be colonized by the insects. In what environment was the victim found? Was it a sandy beach? Was it a wooded area? Was it a desert? Was it urban? Was it rural? All of these can greatly impact the types of insects that are found in an area and therefore the types of insects that can colonize the body. Was the body exposed to sun, shade, or wind? These are all factors that will affect when the eggs are laid. Remember, insects like flies will not lay their eggs when, in areas where it's very windy. They will not um, lay their eggs where it's very dark. Um, they will not most likely lay their eggs in direct sunlight because direct sunlight is not conducive to rearing their young. Okay, Shade would be ideal. Was the body found at night or during the daytime? Again, insects don't lay eggs at night and therefore will not, will not colonize the body at night. Was the victim exposed to toxins, chemicals, or drugs that would affect insect growth rates? Remember, if the individual was poisoned or under the influence of certain um, chemicals, those chemicals will be part of the tissues that the body is made of and therefore can become part of the fly larva as the fly larvae start consuming the tissues that make up the individual that was poisoned. Okay, if those toxins or chemicals affect insect growth rates, then that's going to either speed up or slow down insect development. Did the insects have an adequate food source? Again, were they actually able to colonize the body or was the body not colonizable? Was it a small food source? Was it a large food source? What body fluids were at the crime scene that would attract insects? Again, Blood and decomp gases are going to um, attract bottle flies, but feces, urine, and um, other feces and, and bodily fluids like that are going to attract more of the house flies. 
were any predators in the area that feed upon insects of the body. There are certain beetles that will affect insect development because they come in and they feed on either fly eggs or they feed on fly larvae. If there is a big beetle population and the beetles are completely consuming all of the larvae to the point where there are no larvae and they're eating all of the fly larvae as fast as the flies are putting them there, then obviously there's going to be less larvae for us as the forensic entomologist to look at and therefore try to establish a postmortem interval because all of our evidence is being eaten. How many insects were found on the body? Was it a single species? Was it a bunch of species? If we can utilize a bunch of different species and use their kind of known values, then we can actually get a more accurate reading because we have more data points than if we just have one organism or one species to kind of identify. So how does this estimating post-mortem interval process work? So how is it possible to determine how long it takes insects to develop to each of the different stages when temperatures differ throughout the day? Obviously, in the, in the nighttime, temperatures drop, and then in the daytime, temperatures rises. Um, so how do we go about determining how long it takes insect activity to mature or, or grow in differing temperatures because we obviously can't control the temps outside. Insects have been raised at con constant temps in a lab and the number of hours it takes at an adjusted average temperature has been calculated and we know what that is. It's called ADH or accumulated degree hours. We always use degrees Celsius and it doesn't matter what temperature we're growing them in, we can always as long as we have a temperature, um, identify the ADH at that temperature, which will give us an indication of how long that species or that stage should take. Okay, Some examples of that would be when calculating degree hours for insects in an uncontrolled environment, uncontrolled meaning outside, like an outdoor crime scene, it is necessary to factor in the insect's lower limit threshold which is the temperature below which growth and development cease. A lot of times that's uh, 10 degrees, which is very cold. We're going to add the maximum and minimum temperatures in degrees Celsius for a 24-hour period. So that's basically add the, the low for the day and the high for the day. We're going to add those together, divide by 2 to get the average temperature for the day. So if the high is 20 degrees and the low is 10 degrees, then the average obviously would be 15 degrees. Okay, we're going to subtract the lower limit threshold, which is usually, like I said, 10 degrees C, from the average daily temperature to get the adjusted temperature, again, in Celsius. We're going to multiply the adjusted average temperature by the number of hours in the day to obtain the ADH for that day. Okay, so what does this look like? If we look at how long it takes each stage to progress to the next stage, we know that these stages exist from egg to first instar, from first instar to second instar, from second to third instar, from third to pupa, from pupa to adult. We are keeping this temperature constant to give us a dh, which is degree hours, and then accumulated degree hours to tell us how long at this degrees, at 21 degrees, at this temperature, how many accumulated degree hours it will take each of these stages to progress, right? So what you do is you take our temperature, 21, and you take it times the number of known hours it takes in that stage. Okay, so 21 times 23 will give us 483. That's degree hours. That is a, a calculated a value based on the number of known hours in the stage at the temperature that we're rearing the, the larva in. Again, we do it again. 21 times 27 gives us 567 degree hours at that stage. 21 times 22 gives us 462 degree hours at that stage. 21 times 130 gives us 2,730 degree hours at that stage. Um, and then 21 times 143 gives us 3,003. 
what I want you to kind of think about is these are not actual hours. We call them degree hours, but this is actually kind of the amount of thermal energy it takes that stage to get to the next stage, okay? So then if we start here at 483, it takes 483 thermal energy units, essentially, to get from egg to first instar larva. We add 483 to our next stage, which is 567, and we get an accumulated degree hours of 1,050. It takes 1,050 accumulated degree hours, or this accumulated thermal energy units, to get to our second instar larva. Add 1050 to 462, and we get 1512. 1512 plus 2730, we get 4,242 accumulated degree hours. And we take 4242 2 plus our 3003, and we get our ADH of 7245. That is the total amount of degree hours accumulated among all these stages to rear at 21 degrees Celsius a fly from egg to adulthood. This is the amount of thermal energy units it takes to get one egg to one adult um, at 21 degrees Celsius. Okay? We will apply this information um, in our next video. I will work through an exact um, or a specific example of how to solve a crime scene or how to estimate a postmortem interval utilizing ADH and the calculations for ADH in our next video. See ya.